Welcome to Financial Plan and Explain, and I'm your host, Mike Menninger, certified financial planner, owner and founder of Menninger and Associates Financial Planning. I'm pleased again to have two of my associates uh, join me. Uh, we've got Kyle Ryan, certified financial planner, all the way to the right, and Ryan Keefe uh, in the center. Um, these are two of my associates and two of my junior financial advisors uh, working together. So uh, what we're doing here again today is uh, upon popular demand, we've apparently had a lot of people say this was uh, great episodes we did this before is we've gathered a bunch of questions that have been asked of us or questions that were uh, you know sent to us or what have you so what we're going to do is we're going to literally go through the questions and serve pretty much as a panel uh, to review the answers to the questions uh, with the hopes that uh, a lot of people out there a lot of the viewers do have the same questions themselves and hopefully we're capable of answering those questions so uh, we're ready to go First question, please. You guys ready? All right. Yeah. All right, let's yeah. do it. Let's do it. All right, so we're looking for the first question. So first question was, how do I select my 401k investment options? So, you know, as, as we know, uh, most companies, and not most, but many companies offer 401ks. And with the 401k, they typically will have, you know, 20 or 30 investment selections. And people don't know. So what do you guys suggest? Yeah, well, what I've found in my experience is that what people do when they look at those 20 or 30 options and they really aren't sure which one to go with, they're not sure what the options are, just go to the one that did the best last year, ah, right? <laughs> you know, it's funny. I thought you were going to say that because that's what I found. And then they pick three of them because they want to be diversified. Yep. They pick the three with the highest rates of return yeah. over the last one, three, and five years, and oh, by the way, they're all basically different versions of the same investment. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> so there goes the idea of asset allocation and diversification, yeah, right. right? Yep. Uh, it's always good to get an understanding of what is offered in your 401k, whether it's a 403b, 401k, you know, this question really relates to all of them. Um, and, you know, what we always say is if you don't really know what you're, anything about the options you have, you know, they typically offer what are referred to as target date funds which you select a date which you anticipate retiring and you know say you're 20 years out your fund is going to be rather aggressive and as you get close to retirement it becomes more conservative so those are a great option for people who don't really understand the realm of financial planning or have those to offer advice to help them right and so most 401k plans also offer uh, an investment advisor but uh, Kyle you're right the target retirement funds are great ways of doing it because they're already pre-packaged portfolios that are diverse and you know we've always believed when it comes to investments is diversify yeah, right. you know and diversifying is basically not having all your eggs in one basket so you're gonna have some stocks you're gonna have some bonds you're gonna have some domestic you're gonna have international stocks large caps small caps so you know if you have no experience then we found that the target retirement date funds are really great opportunities right. and options yeah. and and to that point, Mike, um, one thing with the target date funds that we've found a lot of times is when you're investing, you want to understand your risk tolerance. Yep. What is your risk tolerance? It's basically how much can the account fluctuate without you, you know, panicking and selling everything. Um, usually the target date funds actually have a higher level of risk than what most people assume their risk to be. Some people are retiring in, you know, five to 10 years, think they're, you know, a 50-50 split between stocks and bonds. When in actuality, you look under the hood of the target date fund, it might actually be more of a 60, 40, 70, 30 in some ways. Yes, places. I found that. Yeah. I found that myself over and the years. One thing that I always have to remind clients, especially, you know, what, however old you are, you know, if, if you don't anticipate using your 401k, you know, you're in your 40s, early 50s, 20s, 30s, you know, if you don't anticipate using your 401k, don't panic if, you know, there's a slight setback in the market because you're not using this money anytime soon. You know, it's, it's meant to set and forget, and that's the ideal way to look at your 401k, right? Right, right. exactly. Okay, yeah. good answers. What's the next question? I am a self, I am self-employed. What type of retirement plans are available to me? That's actually a very good question. Um, you know, obviously I'm self-employed now, but I have employees. So I'm not sure what was meant by that question, but self-employed individuals have a lot of options available to them. Uh, they can open an IRA. You know, the advantage of an IRA is simple. You just open it. But the downside of an IRA is you're restricted to only $6,000 a year or 7000 if you're age 50 or over. Yep. 
But one plan that's often used by self-employed individuals is the SEP IRA. And SEP is an acronym for Simplified Employee Pension. And it enables the business owner to contribute 20% of their profits to, the four, uh, to, to, a simple, or to a SEP IRA. So if for some reason uh, you have an employer, if I'm making $200,000 as a self-employed individual, rather than contributing six or possibly $7,000 to an IRA, I can contribute 20% of 200,000, which is 40,000. Yep. And allow that to be tax deductible. So that's you know, a great opportunity for an employer to be able to contribute a significantly larger dollar amount to his retirement plan. The downside to that is you're required to whatever you contribute to yourself, you're required to contribute to all of your employees. Yep. And it's not that I would have to contribute 40,000 to each of my employees, but as the self-employed individual, if I'm contributing 20% of my income, I need to contribute 20% of everybody else's income, which may prove to be inefficient. Mm -hmm. But that's why the SEP IRAs are typically used by self-employed individuals who don't have employees. Or very few. And then, you know, as you know, we can take the conversation from a self-employed individual with a few employees to a small business owner who might have, say, hypothetically 10. And then what would you want to do? Well, then you may open either a simple IRA, okay. okay? And simple actually stands for an acronym that I don't remember what it stands for. Uh, because you know why? I don't care. <laughs> I don't need to know. But it is simple. Um, and basically what happens there with a simple IRA is you're creating an account where everybody contributes to the account and you just give them a match yep. up to 3%. So the beauty of that is it doesn't break the business owner for making contributions on behalf of employees. 3% is, is not a lot and it's also given the opportunity for each of the employees to have access to a retirement plan. And then the other one is a 401k plan. And you know, we're all familiar with 401ks. Um, you know, we have a 401k, we have eight employees. What that does is that gives the ability for all of us to actually have a higher contribution limit and a profit sharing plan and there's all kinds of other nifty cool things. So yeah. uh, what we recommend is you know, what's best for you. And generally speaking, you can't operate two of them at the same time, but you can switch from one to another. And similarly, with an S a SEP IRA, I'm not obligated to contribute 20% every year. I could contribute 20% this year. I could contribute 5% next year. The following year, if I have a really lean year and can't afford it, I don't have to contribute at all. So that's the advantage of it. And furthermore, is you could always switch plans. And ironically, during the course of my business ownership, I've gone from a SEP IRA for myself to a simple IRA plan when we had about three or four employees to a full-blown 401k with profit sharing now. So, you know, you could sit here and, and change over time. So that's the beauty of having it. And ultimately, you know, check with your financial advisor and find out what is the best plan for you. Yep. yep. Anything the, you guys want to add? The only other thing I'd add is just, you know, it's not only for you, it's really to meant to better your employees as well. It really retain, adds a layer of retention to Absolutely. your business because Absolutely. I mean, you're, you're adding retirement funds to your employees. They will be grateful for that. Absolutely. Right. It's a benefit. Yep. It's That's a benefit. That is literally what it is. <laughs> exactly. It's a benefit. All right. Let's go for the next question. I am 43 years old. I have $15,000 in my savings account and approximately $20,000 in credit card debt. Oh, boy. <laughs> With low interest. Oh, okay. Define <laughs> what low interest rate is. Okay. Anyway, should I pay off my debt before adding more money to my savings account? Okay. I know the answer to this question is it depends, right? <laughs> Just like every answer yeah, to every financial depends. question. Yeah. Well, well, you're right. You know, you want to really define what, what is low interest. Low right. interest on a credit card could be, you know, 8 9%, 10%. Right. Which um, is still high. Which like is still high. <laughs> um, you know, if you give, you know, there's certain rates of return in the stock market that, you know, you could argue are between, you know, 8 to 12%. But, you know, you're always going to be better off paying down that debt. You get that 
guarantee. Guarantee of exactly. paying off that, that rate. That's a word we can't use often when you're paying off debt. Right, you know? exactly. Yeah, if yeah. you're paying off a 10% interest rate debt, then it's the equivalent of a guaranteed 10% rate of return On just by the sake of penny saved is a penny earned. But the thing is, is that I think the, the uh, viewer was asking, well, they've got money in savings and they got credit card debt. You know, what do you do? Clearly, if you take the $15,000 that's earning hardly anything in savings and you pay off the debt, you're saving, you know, let's assume the 10%, you're saving 10% right out of the gates. But as you know, what happens to their emergency reserve? You know, it's very difficult to pick up the phone and call the credit card company and say, ooh, can I get my $15,000 back? <laughs> and you didn't pay it off with the intent that you're just going to use it right away again. Right. right, right, right. So one of the things that, you know, we've always uh, used, I find it to be uh, probably one of the best tools of anyone really uh, in financial planning, one of the best tools is a line of credit. Yep. Mm -hmm. Particularly for somebody who owns a house, house, home, uh, a home equity line of credit. And if they own their home, you know, they can go to their bank and be able to get a home equity line of credit, which is effectively uh, having access to the equity in their home, and they only pay interest on the amount that they borrow, and typically the interest is substantially less. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, it enables someone who has a savings account to pay off that credit card debt, and then the home equity line of credit serves as an emergency reserve. So long as the first you don't <laughs> abuse it, and right. first words out of your mouth aren't "woohoo, I got more to spend." You know, right. that's not <laughs> yeah. the intent of it. This is meant to be able to use the cash you have available to you to pay off your debt and have a line of credit, as you said it. It's an emergency, emergency reserve. reserve. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, if you don't own a home, you do have the ability to go to your bank and get a um, what they call an unsecured line of credit. Yep. The unsecured line of credit works the same way. However, because it's not secured with your primary residence, for instance, if you have a line of credit and I decide I'm not going to pay it, well, guess what? They take my house. Well, it's secured with my house. Yep. But you can have a unsecured line of credit to the bank and they may give you a $10,000 limit, but that's also not a bad thing to have because it could serve as an emergency reserve because you're not paying interest on it except if you borrow against it. Mm -hmm. And if you had that line of credit, then you probably could spend down some of your savings to pay down your debt. Yep. And if that line of credit is, you know, call it 10,000 at 4%, that's growing a lot slower than a credit card, which is likely going to be at a much higher interest rate. Oh, absolutely. Rate. And absolutely. therefore gives you the added flexibility of time. Right. And you can pay it down, you know, efficiently. Now, not that I'm a huge proponent of the credit card shuffle. Okay, but the credit card shuffle exists out there. I played that game many years ago when I was you know, in, a, in a substantially different position. Uh, and I know clients who do it. If you're good at it, it's actually a way of, of improving your finances. If you have a lot of credit card debt and you're on top of it other than the fact that you don't have the ability to pay it off quickly, what happens a lot of times is that um, a credit card will send you checks in the mail. Okay, and if you write a check, then basically it serves as a cash advance. But they'll give you a 0% for like 18 months or 12 months or even 2% for 18 months, something like that. So if you wrote that check and paid off the other credit card balance, let's say it's 18%, they may charge you, the, the, by writing the check, they may charge you a cash advance fee of 3%. But if you're talking about an 18% credit card, that's 1.5% per month. 3% is only two months worth of interest. If you're in a mode where you're not increasing your credit card debt and you're actually truly paying off your debt, it's a way of controlling the amount of interest that's going out the door so that it'll help you pay off this debt quicker. Absolutely. It's a slippery slope, but you really need to be on the you know, actively driving your debt downside. Yes. Right. Yep. right, a good breaking point. Um, we'll come back to the questions in a few moments. Uh, please stay tuned. We'll be back after this short break. Have you saved enough for retirement? Are you financially prepared for an emergency or unexpected event? Have you thought about your financial future? 
Hi, I'm Mike Manager, founder of Manager & Associates Financial Planning. For over 20 years, we have been answering our clients' questions just like these as we develop unique and comprehensive financial plans tailored to meet their needs. When addressing your financial plan, we incorporate your entire financial picture, including taxes, estate planning, as well as investment planning and retirement planning. So call us today for a complimentary no obligation consultation. A unique approach to financial planning. Welcome back to Financial Planning Explained. I'm your host, Mike Manager, Certified Financial Planner, and I have two of my uh, junior advisors with me today as we continue going through questions and answers of, you know, just serving as a panel. Uh, it seems to be working out pretty cool. Uh, we've had um, high demand for this. So here we go. Let's pick up before we left off. What's yep. the next question we got coming up? We have mm -hmm. roughly $300,000 in first mortgage money, that's interesting, that we plan to spend on remodeling in the next my nine months. Where should we hold that money? That's a very interesting question because I'm not sure that I would have done that. But where, where do you want to go with this? Well, I mean, if you have nine months, you know you have three hundred thousand dollars. If your needs are three hundred thousand dollars, what are you in, what are you taking the risk for? Is my opinion. Is that's honestly my opinion. You know, if what happens if you put it in the market? I mean, no one has a crystal ball to see what it's going to do. Right. You well, take risk. Well, if it goes down, you don't have the money for remodeling anymore. And it's not right. like the stock market can drop thirty-five percent in five weeks. Yeah. <laughs> no, that could never happen. <laughs> Nothing a pandemic. But what are the odds of a pandemic <laughs> happening? One in one hundred years. Yeah. Right. Hey, so, every hundred years. Well, we got another ninety-nine years oh, to go. Good, I guess. Good, right. Yeah. yeah good, good, good. We're good. So, yeah. so you obviously want this money in the safest place yes, possible. Yes. Absolutely. And the, the place that's going to give you absolutely zero risk is going to be cash. It's going right. to be savings. savings account. Right. Um, you know, you get a little bit of interest, but these days that's interest rates, nothing. But at least you're, you're safe. You understand that that 300000 that you have today will be there tomorrow. Right. One of the other things that I would, and I've come across this before, not so much this particular case, but somebody who wants to do this. And one of the things that I've recommended to them is actually to do it in the form of a line of credit. And, you know, we talked about the line of credit in the earlier segment in a different role. So I'm assuming that this individual has a house. They took $300,000 out for the purpose of doing the remodeling. Obviously, that was the question. But one of the things that I probably would have recommended to this if they were my client before they did it is use the line of credit. As opposed to taking your equity out. Right. Because what's happening is that they're having to pay mortgage interest on all of that 300000 the entire nine months. And for all you know... They may have needed 320 or they may have needed 280 or 250. And usually if you're going to do something like that, you're probably going to take out more than you need. Well, my thoughts behind it would be I would have taken out a 300 or $350,000 line of credit. Mm -hmm. Because if you use $50,000 at the end of two months for whatever that remodeling project may be, and then you use another 50 and so on and so forth, what's happening is that you're only paying interest on the balance and then at the end of nine months, then you refinance. Yep. You know, unless they got some special deal or there is risk that interest rates would go substantially higher in nine months, I could see that. But that's probably how I would do it. But, you know, to your point, uh, there's no point in taking risk. Mm -hmm. I mean, single largest component of risk, and we preach it all the time, single largest component of risk is? Time. It's time. Time. Yep. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yep. All right. What's our next question? What is the what is the best way for someone over fifty who has had their retirement wiped out by medical bills to start over? Well, I, I've not just medical bills. Um, you know, unfortunately, I've seen this happen through divorce. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, uh, all of their retirement savings. You, know, you say, well, how could they? You know, aren't they supposed to get half? Well. You know, what happens a lot of times, and let's just use sort of simple numbers, if I owned a $300,000 house and I own a $300,000 retirement account and 
they want half of the assets, well, I may end up giving the retirement account so I can keep the house. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, fact is, is they're in the same boat. Yep. You know, right. what do you do? Well, geez, what would you guys do? What would you suggest? Well, I would start by creating a budget. I mean, yep. every even when you're young and just starting out and you don't have any savings, you start first with creating a budget, you know, analyzing your expenses, seeing where you can save, how much you can save, and, you know, you stay disciplined. And right. when you stay disciplined, you build those savings over time. And uh, this person in this particular question is 50 years old, and that sounds old, but, you know, you still got at least 12 years before you can start collecting Social Security. Right. So you got time. You just got to you got to be careful, max out retirement savings when you can and, you know, just stay stay true to your discipline. Don't overspend. Yeah. And, you know, this question doesn't necessarily have to be somebody that got wiped out just either through starting. divorce. Mm -hmm. it, you see it a lot that, you know, people for a bunch of years, whether it's raising children, they're 50 years old and all of their assets or all of their income was being used for their cost of living. They're 50 years old and they realize, oh no, what do I do now? Mm -hmm. I'm nowhere. And you know, one of the things that I've always said to people, that we've had people come into us, they're afraid to come in because they're embarrassed. Yep. And I say, you leave that at the door. Yep. You know, because of the fact that just by the nature of you coming in to talk to us or talk to a financial advisor suggests that you're serious about turning the corner and moving forward. Yep. So you know, I applaud someone who's, who's taken that step. And you're absolutely correct. You know, it's better to start at 50 than to wait until you're 55 or wait until you're 60, because that's when you're forced later in life to have to work. And you know, God knows we've all seen cases where something happens for whatever reason, whether it be medical or what have you, that you can't work. You can't be, you know, relying on just Social Security because Social Security is just not going to make it. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you know. at this point, it's really time to start developing some habits that, you know, can lead toward, you know, you don't have to start out huge and max out your 401k. If you don't have the ability to do so, you can start small. Right. Mm -hmm. But be consistent. Build good habits. Like you said, start a budget. Do $50 a month in your 401k. 25 Whatever you can start with, it, it creates good habits that can lead to success in the future. Well, and the other thing, too, is, is controlling your expenses. Yeah. And the thing that you pointed out, Ryan, is that... You know, I hate the word budget, although budget works, but you, know, you don't really know what your budget is until you know what your expenses are. And I went through an exercise once years ago where I literally every single dollar that went out the door, I monitored, and it was remarkable how many areas with which you could save money. You know, do you really need to go to Starbucks every morning? Do you really need to go to Chick-fil-A for lunch every day? Do you need to do all these things because you know, a couple bucks adds up that before you know it, it could be a couple hundred dollars a month. A couple mm -hmm. hundred dollars a month makes all the difference in the world. Absolutely. Particularly if you turn around and sticking that into your 401k and getting a couple uh, a match, that's $400 a month, which is $5,000 a year. And you're know, just talking to someone earlier, if you were contributing $5,000 a year for 25 years, now mind you, the 50 year old means it's taking them to age 75, but you do that, you're gonna, build about four or five hundred thousand dollars in assets and that's a game changer that's you know that absolutely. makes the difference of being able to afford living in retirement and you know i don't know what you do absolutely and, and to your point about building good habits pay yourself first you know you get a raise you know put that put some of that raise towards your 401k yes you know you you get a couple extra hundred bucks here or there you know maybe don't go out and celebrate right away put it in your savings put just start building wealth and pay yourself first. You know, it's a couple of things. There are some 401ks out there that allow you to every year increase by 1%. So for instance, if I was putting in 6% um, of my pay, it automatically next year goes to seven and next year to eight and next year to nine. That's a pretty cool way of increasing. Similarly, you know, particularly for people who are either trying to catch up or aggressively want to save, I always say when you get a raise, put half of it immediately into your 401k or some type of savings retirement program. And this way, you're still getting the benefit of the raise, just a little bit less, but you're still getting the benefit of the raise. So we only have a minute or so. 
We have time for another question, or do you think we should uh, close it out here? I think we could tackle this, All right. this last one. Let's get one more question in. Is it true that if I take my rollover money out of my company pension account, that my employer will withhold 20%? Is there a way to avoid that? Well, yes, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, anytime you take money out of your uh, 401k, simple IRA, not simple IRA, but 401k, 403b, or pension, it's an IRS rule. They have to withhold 20% for taxes. How do you avoid it? You roll it over to an IRA. Yep. Okay, now there's a lot of things that we can talk about that are financial planning topics around that, but you know, for the benefit of time, yes, you're required to withhold 20%. Yep. Now, I've seen it happen where they've taken it out and didn't realize it. They also have the ability to put it back in within 60 days. They can open an IRA and put that money back in within 60 days, but you know, if they took 100000 out and they withheld 20% for taxes, that's 20000 they got to come up with that 20000 mm -hmm. They'll get it back at the end of the year when they file their taxes. And, and I've seen, unfortunately, some employers withhold 20% from a, a Roth 401k distribution, oh. which <laughs> makes silly. zero sense. Right. But, uh, but you're, you're without that twenty grand until it comes tax time. Right, exactly. All right, so I think we're going to have to end uh, today's episode here. Uh, we're going to continue doing question and answer episodes for the next few weeks. Uh, hopefully, uh, you're learning something from these. Hopefully, some of these are applicable to you or to someone you know. Um, like, you know, we're here to help and we're here to educate. And so until next time, I hope you have a great day and have a great week. And we'll see you on next episode of Financial Planning Explained.